Football supporters around the world have unique stories as to why they became a fan of a club. It could be through the roots of family and tradition, maybe its location, or a favorite player. Or maybe you're just American. Tragic! But me? They were the red team playing on the television. And my favorite color was red. I was 10, okay? But yes, this small little event bounded me to a decade of pain, suffering, and growing pessimism by the day. All because my favorite color was red. But becoming an Arsenal fan in 2010 also meant I never got to experience the excitement of the Invincibles. Which is why today, I'll be learning quite a bit as we dive into the story of the Arsenal Invincibles. We'll begin the story with the genius and teacher himself, Arsene Wenger. Arsene started his managerial career in France, managing the likes of Strasbourg, Cannes, and Nancy. He then moved to AS Monaco, where he'd win the French League Championship in 1988. Wenger was pretty successful at Monaco, even having Bayern Munich chasing his signature at one point. But in the 1994-95 season, Monaco found themselves 17th in the table in mid-September, which saw Arsene dismissed by the club. The next trip would take Arsene all the way to central Japan, where he'd take on his next challenge. Nagoya Grampus 8. This was a team that finished bottom of the J League in the previous season. This awful form continued into Wenger's tenure for a while, and in response, Wenger adjusted his approach and style. He started to openly question players' desires. He started to expect players to make decisions for themselves instead of relying on the manager. And as a result, this boosted the team morale, and it led to Nagoya winning 17 of their next 27 matches to finish runners-up in 1995. Wenger won the J League Manager of the Year, and then a year later won Japan's domestic Cup, the Emperor's Cup. Wenger's time in Japan didn't last for long though, as he managed his last match on August 28th, 1996. Wenger's next destination? North London. Arriving at Arsenal, Wenger was ready to revolutionize the entire club. Instead of running until you die like most English teams did during training prior, Wenger implemented the use of stopwatches and passing drills to improve not only stamina, but the fluidity of the game. He managed to make training enjoyable which had a significant effect on morale. After a win against Blackburn, Wenger witnessed players eating chocolates on the way back and turned into Michelle Obama before Michelle Obama as he decided to change up everything at the club cafeteria. I think in England, you eat too much sugar and meat, and not enough vegetables, he said. It's hard to believe nowadays, but the diets of footballers back then were pretty awful. Hell, depressed me in 2019 probably had a better diet than some of these footballers. Using inspiration from the food he ate in Japan, Wenger replaced burgers and chips with fish, chicken, mashed potatoes, and steamed vegetables. Alcohol was gone too. Former players later on in their lives came to the conclusion that Wenger's improved diet plan had actually helped them prolong their careers. Then there was Wenger. The teacher. His ability back then to get the best out of a player was absolutely unmatched, and it didn't matter what player either. He signed Colo Torre from Ivorian club ASEC Mimosas for just under 175k euros and turned him into a phenomenal center back. He bought Nicolas Anelka from PSG for a little less than 600k and helped the young Frenchman in honing his skills of pace, goal scoring ability, and heading. Anelka was then sold for 26 million years later. There was that one time he paid 4 million for a French mid midfielder from AC Milan, who became one of the greatest Premier League midfielders of all time. And who could remember that one time he signed a struggling French player from Juventus? Going into the new Premier League season, Arsenal needed a new keeper, as David Seaman was departing from Manchester City. So they brought in Jens Lehmann for just over 1.7 million. Lehmann had a rough campaign for Dortmund the previous season, so this was definitely an iffy transfer at the time. Wenger also brought in notable names like Gael Clichy for 290k, Cesc Fabricas for free, Jose Antonio Reyes for 12 dollars 2 million, and finally, Robin Van Persie for just 3.4 million. What a promising talent. I hope he doesn't move to a rival club because of the club's poor management. Arsenal were lined up in the universal 4-4-2 formation that many English sides used back then. The difference was the 4-4-2 was rarely ever seen because of how dynamic Arsenal played. The more common formation you'd actually see on the pitch was a 4-2-3-1, where Dennis Bergkamp would actually drop back into a creative 10 role. In defense, you had Colo Torre, the ball-playing defender who was very composed. His exceptional vertical passes up field were vital to the system of play. So Campbell beside him was more of the traditional central defender. He was powerful and had an absolute physical presence in the back. Arsenal's fullbacks were probably the earliest versions of what we'd call today the modern fullback. They were encouraged to stretch the play in order to outnumber the opposition on the break. Ashley Cole was more attacking while Lauren was more cautious. The entire defense was quick, which allowed Arsenal to play a higher defensive line. Their strong mid-block made it a struggle for opposition to break down, and it would force teams to play the long ball game, where sweeper-keeper Jens Lehmann would 
would usually clean up. Then you had Gilberto Silva at central midfield, who played a deep role in front of the defense. He was more passive in defense than most in his role, as he would shadow opposition players effectively pushing them back. Patrick Vieira was the heart of the midfield, the true box-to-box -box with physique and strength that allowed him to face anything with no fear like an X Games competitor. Vieira was slightly higher in order to give Gilberto Silva a better passing angle. On the flanks were Freddie Jungberg and Robert Pires. Pires would usually cut inside, either creating a shot himself or linking with Thierry Henry. This in turn gave Ashley Cole the attacking freedom, giving Arsenal the numbers advantage on the attack. Jungberg was more of the traditional winger. He'd dribble at defenders, pushing them back. Then there was Dennis Bergkamp and Thierry Henry on the attacking front. As mentioned before, Bergkamp dropped back from the striker position into a creative 10 role. He may have been 34, but his technical ability and vision were still incredible. Thierry Henry usually drifted towards the left and then drove forward diagonally towards goal. Thierry in general though had what looked like no limit to his range of shooting. His dribbling abilities could slice up a defense like nothing too as seen from multiple solo goals in his career. He is considered one of the greatest Premier League players of all time for a reason, you know? This formation and system was built for such a highly balanced side like the Gunners. The aforementioned strong mid block was used to devastating effect on the counter for Arsenal. Their attacks on the break were so quick that one blink of an eye and they'd be in the opposition's final third already. Their blistering speed as a unit was what made them a neutral's favorite. Long gone were the days of boring old Arsenal. To kick off the 2003-04 season, Arsenal started their campaign winning 2-1 versus Everton. They then followed it up with three more wins, including one against Man City where Lauren would show his brilliant finishing ability. Too bad it was his own net. The 2000s era was a different time for football, as we all know. Manchester United versus Arsenal meant more than just a match between two meme teams. <laughs> The Battle of Old Trafford was no exception on September 21st, 2003. Late into the match, Patrick Vieira was sent off after kicking out at Ruud van Nistelrooy, who had pretty much jumped right into the midfielder. Then, to make things worse for Arsenal, Diego Forlan went down in the box, which rewarded Manchester United a penalty in injury time. Ruud van Nistelrooy had the opportunity to win it for United, but cracked the crossbar. Then, after the final whistle, he was immediately hounded and confronted by the Arsenal players as they pushed him around, which then created a massive altercation between the two teams. Hell! Even young Cristiano Ronaldo wanted some smoke. A bunch of fines and suspensions later, Arsenal defeated Newcastle 3-2, then Liverpool 2-1 away from home through a beautiful Robert Pires curler. Chelsea at Highbury were next, and Arsenal again put another team to bed. The Gunners ended October with a draw against Charlton, which saw them up at the top of the league with 24 points. Throughout November, the Gunners continued their winning ways. 4-1 at Leeds, a clutch 2-1 against rivals Tottenham at home, albeit a pretty lucky deflection, and a 3-0 win away at Birmingham. At this point, Arsenal had set a new Premier League record starting a season unbeaten in 13. The end of November saw a slight dip in form for Arsenal as they drew against Fulham and then a week later conceded an injury time equalizer away at Leicester. The next three matches saw Wenger's men take on Blackburn, Bolton, and Wolves. They earned seven points out of a possible nine and reached the halfway point of the season still unbeaten, earning 45 points through 12 wins and six draws. Unbeaten? Sure. But league leaders? Not quite. Arsenal were actually second place, just one point behind Man United. Going into the second half of the Premier League campaign, Arsenal defeated Southampton only to squander yet another three points, conceding a late equalizer to Everton. Middlesbrough was up next, and they were destroyed 4-1 at Highbury in what Wenger deemed one of the best displays of the season. The win versus Borough set a fire in Arsenal, as they'd win their next eight consecutive matches. This was the so-called new Arsenal, in full effect. During the stretch, Henri scored his 100th Arsenal goal versus Southampton. Then there was the quick 20 minute turnaround at Stamford Bridge showcasing the devastating Arsenal attack. Following a 7th straight victory against Charlton, the Gunners struggled to hold on to after being so dominant in the first half, starting to sense a bit of a pattern here. They went top of the league with 67 points in 27 matches, 9 points clear of both Chelsea and United. The win streak came to an end with a draw to United in late March. Lauren could have made it 10 straight for the Gunners, but his attempt was saved. I'm sure they were happy with the draw though, with two cup matches congesting the schedule. But Arsenal also set a new all-time league record of 30 matches unbeaten. The Gunners did lose both cup matches and had Liverpool at Highbury next. The form continued to look down with Finland's Sami Hupia giving Liverpool the lead just five minutes in. But then Thierry Henry went beast mode and scored a hat-trick that helped Arsenal to a 4-2 win and yet another great turnaround. The 
following match of St. James against Newcastle was a goalless draw, but then came another Henri masterclass as he scored four against Leeds United in a 5-0 victory. Arsenal were now just within two wins of winning the league title, but with Chelsea struggling, they only needed actually just one point in their next match. And where to next? Their rival's fortress, White Hart Lane. Arsenal went 2-0 up, but then got pretty complacent and let the lead slip. This wasn't exactly something they were new to. But on this day, they didn't care too much about a two-all draw because once the final whistle blew, the bigger picture was that Arsenal had just won the title at their rival's ground. Arsenal returned home and had a case of title hangover, playing a goalless draw against Birmingham, where on a different day, could have seen Birmingham end the unbeaten run. It happened again away at Pompey. With a one-all scoreline, striker Yakubu should have ended the unbeaten run when he had a one-on-one -on -one with the keeper, but he fluffed his lines and shot it straight at him. Finally, Arsenal got over their hangover, beating Fulham through a single goal from Jose Antonio Reyes. And then on the last match day, after being a goal down early on, Arsenal once again turned things around against opponents Leicester City to win their 26th match of the season, and more importantly, cap off their season of invincibility. 26 wins, 12 draws, and zero losses. At the end of the season, Thierry Henry won Golden Boot with 30 goals. He also won the PFA Players Player and the PFA Fans Player of the Year. Along with those achievements was a fourth place finish in the 2004 Ballon d'Or. Arsenal's next best top scorer was Robert Pires with 14 to his name, including 8 assists. In terms of assists, Dennis Bergkamp was right behind Pires with 7. Arsenal going forward were the best in the league, but their defense was just as good, conceding the least amount of goals with 26. Jose Mourinho's Chelsea scored 95 points, conceded less, and scored more than the Invincibles just a year later. Manchester United had their trouble winning season and their 07 08 season. City Centurions from 2017 18 earned 100 points and smashed the record for most points in a Premier League season. Liverpool scored just one point less in the 2019 20 season. But there's only one team that has managed to go invincible throughout an entire modern Premier League season the Arsenal team of the 2003-2004 season. Many will debate which of these teams is considered the best, and it all comes down to what criteria people use to determine it. Do you think having more points with very few draws and a couple losses is better than an unbeaten record with significantly more draws? Or maybe you include accolades into the conversation. If that is the case, more than likely you see the trouble winning United side of 98-99 as the greatest of all time. Many do say Arsenal's Invincibles got pretty lucky. I mean, hell, United could have ended their unbeaten streak way back on match day 6 had Van Nistelrooy not hit the crossbar. But any of these teams who have reached these incredible feats had to get a little bit lucky at some point. So in my opinion, you shouldn't disregard a team's success just because of some luck here or there. Arsenal's invincible record should be celebrated because of how incredibly difficult it is to go invincible through an entire 38 match campaign. I mean, look at Liverpool in 1920. They were considered by many as the next Premier League side to achieve invincibility. Out of 27 matches, they lost none and drew just once. But even as strong as they were, they fell to Watford on match day 28. Arsenal's achievement may not make them great in everyone's opinion. Those who define greatness only by European Cups, back-to-back -back titles, and triple cartwheels on the way to every goal. But it is staggering in its own right. But what do you think? Did Arsenal have the greatest Premier League season of all time? And if not, which team would you say did? Let me know in the comments. I love making these types of video essays, but they take forever. So if you want to see more, support the channel, tell people about the channel, just share this video all everywhere you can. Be sure to follow my socials of my Twitter, my Instagram, my TikTok, I'm trying to get to 5k there, and also my Twitch. But until then, I'll see you guys.